Okay, thank you very much for coming. It's a hot afternoon. Uh, so let's uh, uncover what you've contributed already so far. So let's have a look. Ah, this is, just to give you a chance to have a look, what, what you and your uh, fellow attendees have said. So it's always when you do one of these menti questions, you, you have to try and guess what the, that, uh, the, the big ones in the middle are, which is when many people have given the same answer to the question. So we, everything ranges, so I think I can, uh, yes, uh, prevent the sheep factor, so you can't enter, enter your suggestion anymore. So we've got inequality, money, the free market, socialism, wealth, uh, best economic system, Neoliberalism, then some political references to voting, for example, uh, greediness, uh, wealthy, exploit white men. Right, so let's um, keep that in mind since this is going to be the topic of, of the talk today. So what I want you to do now is to answer this question. So just a guess, guessing, quick, quick, quick. Okay, that's a lot of answers. So I'm going to close the voting and show the results. Okay, very interesting indeed. Uh, so. Sorry, let me just go back to that one. Yeah, right. So the majority of you uh, had the correct answer, which is 15 times, roughly 15 times as large. So the 15 times as large, just stick your hands up. Right, okay, well scattered around the room, excellent. That was a fact. Now I want you to, to speculate. So this is the speculative question, question three. Same length of time. Same question, but looking ahead. Okay, I think that's, that's enough. Let's have a look what you said for this one. We've got the whole span, right? So, in fact, not that many of you think that the trajectory going forward is going to be the same as it was over the last eight decades. But then you're really all over the place. So you have very, very different views about what kind of future... Um, uh, we, 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 we might see in the year 2100. You'll be well and fit by at that time, so you'll be able to uh, test out how good your prediction was. Now I want you to think about what was on your mind. What were you thinking about when you answered that question? Just take a stab at the one that is closest to what was on your mind. Okay, you're very quick on this one. So let's uh, let's have a look. Less attention to inequality within countries. Um, the a lot of you focusing on the potential of new technology. Last question.
Everyone got their answer in? Okay, fantastic. Let's close it and have a look. Four, four, four. Very, very finely balanced. Very, very fascinating. Okay. Let's, um, let's get going then. And uh, what I want to do now is start. But we actually have started because you've, you've already put in a lot of the, uh, the effort so far. And what I want to give you is some facts. So that last question about whether humanity is doomed you can see you really just hit the nail on the head as a representative sample of, uh, of the UK uh, population group in this, in this study. Okay, so it was 16 to 25 year olds, so you're, you know, you're right there in the, the relevant group. 50-50, you can see that looking across countries in the world, there's a lot more pessimism among young people in India and optimism among young people in Nigeria. There are a whole series of research questions that are right there in front of you. So I'm not gonna go into that any, any further, but just to, um, to place your views within this broader global picture. What I'm gonna talk about this afternoon are, are the following. So this is all you really have to remember. So hockey sticks, skyscrapers, pliers, and then eight Cs. So cathedrals, capitalism, creative destruction, colonies, cotton, calories, carbon, and decoupling. So hopefully by the end of this, you will have some way of telling a story that will link these, um, uh, these terms together. Where I want to start is with, uh, with the hundreds and hundreds of years where nothing happens. So you can see here, if you look along from the year 1000, and we're measuring up the vertical axis average incomes in countries, then nothing, nothing happening, and there's really no difference between average incomes or very little difference between average incomes in uh, the United Kingdom or what became the United Kingdom, China, and India. But then something happens here, and that's the first thing, right, the hockey stick. You've got the hockey stick. It's an ice hockey stick because it captures this idea that there's a phase transition a transition from a world, a flat world, where nothing happens, things go up, things go down, but there isn't this experience of a continuous increase in living standards. There's another hockey stick. Much later, you can see that the same pattern of moving onto a path of consistently rising living standards uh, uh, began in China and India. So now I want you to, to watch the world change over four, four decades. So let's get this going. Now, what have we got here? We've got all the countries in the world lined up from the ones with the lowest income on the left-hand side to the ones, the green ones, uh, with the highest incomes on the right-hand side. The width of the block measures the population of the country. So China has a really wide block, India has a really wide block, and there are lots of really thin blocks for countries with much smaller populations. And then within each country, the lowest income 10% are the block at the front, and then the skyscrapers are the people with the highest incomes in the highest decile, right? So this is, have a, have, try and fix this in your mind, and notice that the countries are organized by colors. So once we, once we get things going, you can see what happens. Okay, let, let's stop. Have a look at what's happened to China. So China was way over to the left-hand side. It's already leapt over some countries and is beginning to move up. Something else you can notice is that the skyscrapers are beginning to become better defined at the back. So the top 10% in these different countries are becoming more differentiated from, uh, from those lower down the income distribution. Keep watching China. So the world has transformed, has been transformed over those four decades. 
and that presents us with something that we uh, that we, we we need to understand. We need to have a way of thinking about this because it's going to turn out to be important for the future. So let me just go to the. Oops, here we go. Where's this? Can anyone guess quickly? Anyone been there? Just give a shout, guess. There's definitely someone in the room who knows where this is. Let me give you a... a yes, very good, Shanghai. Okay. Look at the gold boxes. This is the Peace Hotel in Shanghai. That hasn't changed. So try and guess in your mind over what period of time did this dramatic transformation in this view, this is just a view, right? Did that take place? So that's 2013 already, 2013. And that's 1987. So this is just a quarter of a century to go from the picture on the left to the picture, of the picture on the right. And I'm going to argue that that, in a, in a view, is a way of seeing capitalism at work. In China, yes, but capitalism at work. And this shows you how you can calculate the, the average growth rate and the power that compound growth has to uh, generate th that change over a quarter of a century. This is another way of thinking about how the, world's, how the world's transformed. So this is looking quite differently, taking a different perspective and saying, uh, let's have a look at the share of world output. So go way back to 1500. The share of world output in Asia is above 60%, stays the same for hundreds of years. And the West, you can see, is the red line. And then something happens. That's the Industrial Revolution, transforms the, the global composition of output. And that's now, that's this century. This is the hockey sticks in China and India, turning the world back around from the way it looked after the Industrial Revolution and pushing Asia back uh, as, the, as, as the, the major force in, in global, global output. So these are the pliers. So you've had hockey stick, skyscrapers and pliers. The argument I'm going to suggest is that the world was transformed in those different ways that I've highlighted by a new economic system and what we could refer to as new rules of the game. And if you're asked to define capitalism, then three, there are three elements of it. So private property, markets, and firms. So what do we mean we, by this? We mean that it's an economic system in which the main form of economic organization is the capitalist firm, where the private owners of capital goods, capital goods privately owned, capitalism, capitalists, right? That's how those terms fit together. Those private owners hire labor to produce goods and services to be sold in markets with the intention of making a profit. So that summarizes this new different economic system that has driven the growth of uh, average incomes. What's so special about this economic system? One way of thinking about it is that it's, it's the first economic system in which an elite can fail. So the economic elite in a capitalist system um, can fail in the sense that if you fail as a capitalist, you're an ex-capitalist. Whereas if you're a landlord, so think of a preceding economic system, you're just a pretty hopeless landlord, but you don't lose your status as a landlord. So capitalism has, uh, has at its heart this, uh, this very dynamic process. And it was captured in, in the words of uh, the Austrian economist in the middle of the last century, Joseph Schumpeter, with this term creative destruction, right? So the destruction bit is, is the, uh, becoming the ex-capitalist. New technologies and management systems push out old firms and their owners 
can fail or go bankrupt. And this creative destruction process relies on risk-taking entrepreneurs. They're like the engine of the, uh, of the capitalist economic system. So the argument that I'm trying to suggest with the, those uh, big transformations I've sketched for you is that capitalism is good for innovation, it's bad for inequality, and we'll come back to thinking about the planet. But what is this business about accumulation, accumulating wealth? Think, think of this example here, right? Five million pounds. To you and me, that's a lot of wealth. Some of you will think this is like a really unrealistic example, or at least this is a hopeless footballer. If, they're pl if they play for 15 years, then they only accumulate five million, right? But that's just to set up, to set the scene, to give you a kind of concrete example, right? So think about that and think about these questions. Is this kind of accumulation of wealth possible for everyone? Is it mostly down to hard work? Is it fair? And does it have a positive impact on society? So think about how you'd answer those questions, just thinking about this sports person who's accumulated five million as a result of their salary over um, 15, 15 years. Okay, everyone got in mind what, how you'd answer the question? Good. Then have a look what the results were in this big sample just earlier this year. <coughs> possible for everyone? No, Hope, hopeless. Well, that's obvious, it's not possible for everyone. Is it mostly down to hard work? Not, not on the whole, so there's an average negative answer to that. So there's a lot of talent involved, for example. Uh, luck, is it fair? Yeah, people were pretty okay about it, right? If you've accumulated your five million through doing well at sport, fair enough. And does it have a positive impact on society? Could be, could be not, right? There's nothing either very positive or very negative there. So keep that one in mind, and now think of a different way of accumulating the five million. So let's think of this one. Building a business from scratch and selling it. So this is what we'd think of as a, as a kind of capitalist venture, right? You build a business from scratch. It's not like to do with inheritance. And you then sell, sell it out and you've got five million. So think again about how you would answer these questions. So this is what the, the survey results showed. Negative for is this possible for everyone, all right? So it's pie in the sky to think that everyone can just set up a business and sell it out for five million. Is it mostly down to hard work? Well, people seem to think there was a fair amount of hard work involved. Is it fair? Look how overwhelmingly strongly positive the answer to that is, that somehow accumulating wealth in this way, even compared with someone accumulating it through sport, is somehow more positive and uh, that it has a positive impact on society. So there's something kind of positive about, um, about this form of accumulation, which is pretty central to uh, how we think of it, uh, the capitalist rules of the game operating. Was it always like this? Well, it, it's all, there's always been innovation. So it's not like somehow innovation just, just suddenly arrived on the scene. There were lots of innovations in medieval times. You probably know them, like gunpowder, the printing press. There's a whole string of, of in, uh, innovations then. And those innovations pushed up average incomes for a while. But what happened to the to the, the surpluses that were produced through this innovation process in that period. Well, economists do all kinds of really weird things, but one thing they do is go and measure things. So someone has actually gone and measured in cubic meters, you can see here, the church building that took place from 1270. So those blocks show you the volume of church building that occurred. And you can see that uh, that the income per head was, was rising, that's the GDP per capita, the blocks, and that that was followed by more church building. So that's what they did when they accumulated wealth in the Middle Ages. They had wars and they had cathedrals. So prosperity and confidence in the future were good for church building, 
whereas recession and uncertainty tended to have the opposite effect. In a devout age, people built for the glory of God when times were good, and the better that times became, the more they built, the more churches, those cubic meters of church that were built. So how did we go from there, from anyone can identify the, the cathedral on the left? Just give a shout out. The cathedral on the left, it's been mentioned indirectly. It's Lincoln <laughs> Cathedral. Okay, um, anyway, that's Lincoln Cathedral. So how did we go from the cathedral to the factory? Okay, and you can see here women and children working in the factory. So how did we go from conquest and cathedrals to capitalism? And why did this happen first in Britain, this little island off the coast of Europe, and in the 18th century? That's, that's, a, that's the kind of question that economics can help us to answer. And I'm going to talk about three kinds of arguments. Expensive labor and cheap coal, driving labor-saving innovation in England rather than elsewhere. I'm going to talk about the reversal of fortune in the global textile industry. And I'm going to talk about cheap calories in cotton, the role of colonies in slavery. So let's think of this, this business about what, what this sounds very economics-y, right? Some, somehow something to do with relative prices of labor and energy. And it, let's have a look at the data. Compare Newcastle and Beijing. Remember, same level of income per capita for those hundreds of years, but something very different happened in terms of relative wages. So wages were, went up much higher relative to the cost of a, of, the, of a ton of coal, the energy from a ton of coal, in Newcastle, so the north of England, than was the case in Beijing, and everywhere in between. So there was a real incentive for labor-saving innovation to take place in England relative to uh, other parts of the country and other parts of the world. So it was the north of England. And the, 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 the owners who were able to take advantage of innovating, of introducing a new technology that was heavy in the use of energy and machinery and light in the use of labor, they were able to produce more cheaply, get profits, and, uh, and wipe out their labor-intensive competitors. That's how the creative destruction process began in the Industrial Revolution. The producers who didn't, couldn't adopt to the new, uh, adapt to the new technology, they, they didn't adopt it, then the firm fails and exits the market. That's the creative destruction process. So there are stronger incentives in England for more innovation to keep a step ahead and to get those potential profits. So this is a typical kind of economic model where we can look at the, the technology. There are just two ways of producing 100 meters of cloth in our model. The method B, you can see it uses a lot of workers along the horizontal axis and not much coal. And then there's uh, the only other way of producing the cloth is with very few workers and a lot of coal. So a lot of mechanization in, in the production process. And uh, in the 1600s, firms were using technology B. There's no incentive to use technology A because that's just going to be more costly. So you're going to choose technology B. But if the price of labor goes up, relative to the price of energy, then A is the cheapest way of producing 100 meters of cloth compared with B. You'd never choose B once those relative prices have changed. And that's what sparks into action the ideas of the new technology and makes it worthwhile for them to be put in place in the, uh, in the factories that were emerging. OK, so this is all kind of a long time ago. But let's switch now to China, to that hockey stick in China. And think about this company called Red Collar. We're now in the 1990s, and Red Collar produced uniforms, like kind of fairly mundane textiles. That's what 
yeah, it, it's, it was specialized in. Around the 1990s in China, wages began to increase and profits fell in the, in the textile industry. So this red collar decides to exit from uni, uni, making these uniforms and what's it going to do? The owner entrepreneur, so the capitalist, chooses to enter a different market in the face of that increase in, in, in the cost of, uh, of labor and the availability of some new technology. Uh, red collar becomes cute smart. And the, the new industry that that company enters is the made to measure suit industry. So basically what this uh, cute smart did is that they uh, implemented a whole a sophisticated com computer assisted design process and in terms of getting the made to measure bit of it they they had a bus and the bus would drive around the city and if you wanted to get a made to measure suit you would get on the bus and put on a special suit and then they would use laser technology to take all the measurements the measurements would then be sent back to the factory and you would get this, uh, this perfectly fitting made-to-measure suit at a fraction of the cost of a traditionally tailor-made made-to-measure made suit. So the tailoring firms notice the falling prices as Cute Smart expands the market and they either exit or adopt the new technology. So that just gives you a very current example of this creative destruction process. So far, it sounds kind of really dynamic, good. New technologies are being introduced. Uh, output per worker is going up. But what about inequality? Have a look here. Look at 1760 to 1860. A hundred years. Output per worker is going up. That's the blue line. But what happens to real wages? The red line. Nothing. Nothing. The workers didn't benefit from the new technology over a whole hundred year period. So even when you get this process of innovation underway, there isn't any automatic process that translates that into higher incomes for workers. Capitalism is good for innovation, but bad for inequality. And what we need to understand how wages eventually went up is to bring in uh, uh, some political changes combined with economic changes. So what happened is that the rising demand for labor, so it's a really economic force, an increase in the demand for labor from the factories and the fall in labor supply when legislation, right, a change in the rules of the game meant that ch children couldn't be employed in the factories uh, or children below a certain age couldn't be employed in the factories, and these changes were pushed through by the extension of the right to vote. So that's when we start to see rising real wages. And you can uh, see that we need to bring both of these things together to understand the, the feed through, if you like, from all of that innovation that was happening to higher living standards. OK, so that's the one part of the explanation of why England, why Britain, and why in the 18th century. So that was all about expensive labor and cheap coal, making it profitable to innovate in, uh, in textiles. This is really a big, big story about textiles. Uh, and here we see a look, a very sad looking hockey stick. And this is what happened to uh, uh, incomes per capita and GDP per capita in India, you can see India and China on here, um, during the period uh, uh, in, in which colonization played a role. So 1600 was when the British East India Company went to India and through that period uh, and similar events were happening in China, incomes were falling. It wasn't until independence that incomes began to rise in India and uh, by then remember they were all the same for those hundreds and hundreds of years before the Industrial Revolution and then all of a sudden um, uh, 
uh, only after independence does uh, GDP per capita start to rise in India. And by then, in, in Britain, it was 11 times as high. So we can answer the question of, did British colonization reduce living standards in India? There's reasonable basis for thinking that that was the case. And one of the mechanisms that happened is that it was India that had dominated global textiles before manufacturing began of textiles in the north of England. And you can see this from this quote from Daniel Defoe, who wrote Robinson Crusoe. He said, this was in 1727, we saw all our women in England, rich and poor, clothed in Indian-made calico. So Indian was, India was completely dominant in, in the global textile market before the Industrial Revolution. And then there was a great reversal of fortune. If you're interested in, in following up uh, these arguments, there's a fantastic video on the Discover Economics site where you can really see ec economists, economic historians at, at work at their craft trying to put together the data and the, and the modeling that can lie behind these uh, claims that I'm, I'm making. So that's the world transformed. And the third element that I, I uh, I want to bring to the table, still textiles, 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 because what, were, what was the input into those uh, textile mills in the north of England? It was cotton. Cotton produced by enslaved labour in British colonies in North America. But how do we know it was necessary? Okay, we could see it. We could see the cotton coming, but was it actually necessary for the Industrial Revolution? In, in Britain. Well, one way of thinking about this that economists tend to use is a counterfactual. What would have had to be the case um, if cotton had not been available as a raw material? If wool had been used instead, then it would have needed more than all of Britain's crop and pasture land. There just wasn't enough land to make the wool for an industrial revolution built around wool cloth rather than cotton. And then comes the second uh, crucial um, uh, line of argument about uh, slavery, which is that uh, think of all the labor being pulled off the farms in England and into those industrial cities that were uh, growing in the north of England. They had to be fed. So people were producing less on the land, needed the calories, and it's the calories that came from the sugar produced by enslaved labor in the British West Indies. So that was also can be argued uh, as being essential for the Industrial Revolution. Without the colonial markets, right, the reversal of fortune in India, instead of India supplying the world, it's the mills supplying the world. Cotton and calories, costs would have been higher, profits lower, slower growth of output per worker, and a kind of stunted, rather feeble kind of hockey stick, rather than that dramatic uh, continuous increase in uh, GDP per capita. Time for a break. So have a look at this. So the question of this one is where and when. Very good. Well, actually, the week before last, but yeah, you're you're absolutely uh, correct. So this is Monday, the top row. Tuesday, the second row. Wednesday, the third row, in New York. And and what are the colours? Yeah. So the colours are, are reflecting the quality of the air. So this one, this was the Wednesday, 2 p.m. This, this was the worst air quality, so they claimed. I think it was shown to be an exaggeration the next day. But they claimed it was the worst air quality anywhere on Earth that day. So this was from the wildfires in Canada, in New York. So this is kind of the transition to the last thing I want to talk about, which is to put together capitalism and coal which produced the hockey stick growth that I've spent a lot of time on, but also climate change. 
another hockey stick, carbon concentration in the atmosphere and temperature. You will have uh, seen, uh, probably seen this one before. And let's just pause for a minute and think about what, what's the economist kind of response to this problem of the emission of carbon uh, where there's no price mechanism to provide the incentives to prevent too much carbon being put into the atmosphere. So the economist's response to this would be, well, we should have a carbon tax. We should put a price where there was no price, and that will change the incentives, and people will uh, choose to uh, adopt methods of production and consumption that are less carbon intensive. So, so far, so good. But that story of using a carbon tax, usually in the economist's toolbox, goes along with this second bullet, which is often not mentioned, but which is that there's the potential for the redistribution of the revenue from the carbon tax, sometimes called a universal carbon, carbon div, uh, dividend, um, in a way that would be, be, it would be possible to compensate poorer, lower income people for whom energy and carbon is a bigger share of their budget. So a carbon tax doesn't fall evenly across the income distribution. So the idea is when we think of a carbon tax, well, that's great, we can have a carbon tax, but then kind of in, in brackets and a universal um, carbon dividend to deal with the distributional effects. This is rather too optimistic as you will have jumped to the conclusion. It assumes that we can get around all of the difficult political problems and there's somehow a powerful and benevolent world government to implement it. But I also think it's too pessimistic if we put all of our eggs into the carbon tax uh, bucket because it ignores other market failures. So just really concentrating all your efforts and thinking about that difficult problem of externalities or the external effects of the unpriced carbon, you may be not looking hard enough uh, at some of the other market failures that uh, that are characteristic of the current situation and of, uh, provide ways of thinking of dealing with the, uh, with the climate crisis. So it's one, it's, it, it's a extraordinarily challenging problem. You are split half and half about whether you thought we were doomed because of climate change. I'm suggesting that Climate, the climate crisis is, is, a, is a challenge. It should be an energizing challenge to economists. And we should be able to deploy all of our tools. We have a really rich set of tools that can help us to intervene in a constructive way. So we can think about the role of government subsidies and research funding for solar from the 1970s. Firms scale up the production of solar PV and wind. These are economic concepts of economies of scale and learning by doing that drive down average costs. Renewables providers can then compete for market share on price and end users respond to those falling prices and to expected uh, lower future prices. So this is a remarkable picture. Have a look at this. And have a look at what's being measured on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis. So what kind of scale is this that's being used here to show the relationship between cumulative installed solar PV capacity and the cost? What kind of scale are we using here? Yeah. Uh, and the, are you talking about the vertical or the horizontal? And the horizontal? He's the prize winner. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, so this is, a, this is a ratio scale. You can see it's going 1, 10, 100, 1,000 along the, along the horizontal. So what, what we're saying, what you're getting at, is that for the same sized interval, it's, uh, we're showing 10 times more in each step on here, and we're showing a doubling at each equal sized step up the vertical, and that's why it's called a ratio scale. But look at that, it's like a straight line. 
from 1976 to 2019. If anything, there's been some speeding up uh, after 2005. So costs fall by 20% every time capacity doubles. And look how much capacity is doubled, right? So this is an extraordinary example of how a technology, the, the, the stimulus for developing the technology, for developing the technology at scale, and then the private incentives to, to produce these panels has, has uh, resulted in uh, uh, the dramatic fall in cost and the fact that even by 2019, by these data, it was cheaper to install um, renewables than it was to install gas-fired electri uh, electricity generating capacity. And economics can help us understand uh, why this has happened. Some of you thought that the world was going to be smaller. I mean, quite a chunk of you, actually. Smaller uh, eight decades out than it is now. And you may have been very pessimistic about the possibility of decoupling. So what this chart is showing you is, and the data here are from 1990, it's showing for Sweden growth of GDP per capita, so growth of incomes per capita, and a reduction in uh, uh, consumption, either on a consumption basis or a production basis. So that's what decoupling means. It means that growth is possible, so you can have a twice, five times, maybe something at least, a larger global output if you can achieve decoupling. And then your response to this will be, well, you know, Sweden is Sweden, uh, Sweden actually had a carbon tax and half of Sweden's reduction in CO2 was due to the carbon tax, but most countries are just not like Sweden. So this is somehow maybe not so optimistic. We'll have a look at this. These are not all Sweden. There are all kinds of countries that for which we can show uh, decoupling between 2005 and 2019. So this is suggesting that it, it is possible to have continued growth and, uh, uh, and yet have carbon emissions falling. Another very uh, familiar economic kind of term that you're, you're taught about and you're you're told that you know, we have to do cost-benefit analysis. Well, when we're dealing with a problem like climate change, there's actually another concept that's, that's probably more relevant. And this is what's now called cost-effectiveness. So the idea about cost-effectiveness is to say economists are going to be part of a team that relies on scientists. So what the science does, or what has to be done with the science, is to use it to achieve a consensus across all the countries in the world, so 194 of them uh, uh, in the Paris Accord, had, had to come to an agreement about the science. What about? About the need to avoid a catastrophic outcome. In other words, we're in a world in which there are tipping points. The science says that. If everyone can agree on the science, then the economists have a role to play. So what e economics' job then is to minimize the, 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 the costs of avoiding this catastrophic outcome. Um, uh, and we can think of this like a guardrail on a cliff. Right? You don't, you don't want to, it's not like a marginal analysis about whether you're going to fall off a cliff. You want a guardrail to stop people getting too close to the edge. So that's the same thinking that's behind this, um, this cost-effectiveness approach. You can see that I made the slides in the, 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 land, you know, the big format, and uh, it's, it's messing up the arrows, but never mind. And what we can recognize, if we're thinking like this, right? Science is giving us the, the catastrophic risk. That provides us with the guardrails, and then economics has to deliver 
uh, at least cost within those guardrails. And once we're thinking like that, we can imagine the possibility of a new, cleaner, more attractive form of growth. Yeah, I'm, I'm just about getting there. Uh, I just wanted to kind of make this a bit more concrete um, and, and suggest to you that there are, you can look at this in much more detail. I'm just going to give you two of the scenarios that come out of this way of thinking. So one is the green road, which gives warming of three degrees by 2100. And the other is a fossil fueled, what you could call a techno optimist road, but we'd kind of fry um, or you would, I would not any longer be here, in, in 2100. Um, uh, unless, you, you have to be a techno-optimist to think that's going to work out, because somehow there's got to be a new technology that enables survival. And here we've got your answers to the question at the very beginning of the lecture, when I said, how large do you think the world is going to be in the year 2100? So here, here are the answers in these scenarios. If you said 10 times, then that's consistent with the uh, 5 degrees of warming. If you said 5 times, that's, that's consistent with this, this baseline uh, green road, 3 degrees of warming. But both of these scenarios have global inequality falling dramatically. And that's why when I asked you what was in your mind, I wanted you, some of you thought about that, obviously. Um, are we going to get to a world in 2100 with the same degree of inequality that we have now across the countries in the world? Or, or can we imagine a different future? So both of these scenarios bring global inequality by 2100, so 80 years out there in the future, down to roughly the level of inequality that there is in a country like Denmark. So this really brings global inequality right down. And that's why you need a lot more stuff, right? If you're going to do anything serious about the poor, uh, poor in the world, then you can't go for the degrowth or the no growth uh, scenario because you will not be able to lift those people out of poverty. So this, this green scenario is a kind of a uh, modest increase in incomes for, for, for rich people, not much at all, and pulling the poor up out of, uh, out of poverty. So you, there are a lot of things you've got to keep in your mind when you're thinking ahead about this kind of scenario. In both of these, global population peaks about 2050. Okay, so how do we implement this? I'll do this very quickly, and you might want to ask some questions about it. So. We, we've got this continuum from government to market where you can see government can ban things. So that's a very helpful power of government. Markets can, for example, scale up production of photovoltaic cells. That's a fantastic capacity uh, of, of market. So the, these uh, uh, mechanisms, government and market, have complementary capabilities in terms of dealing with the climate crisis. We need to use mixtures of government authority and market or capitalist creative destruction. But we also need to recognize a role for civil society. <clears throat> so there's, got a, there's a load of things that are, just don't fit on that continuum. So there's intrinsic motivation for doing environmental work. There's open science, what we're doing. There's uh, civil society leading changes in preferences which push firms to innovate in different ways. Social movements, for example, are, have played an important role in shifting some of the consumption patterns and, and patterns of innovation. But it's not all kind of warm and fuzzy down there in the civil society poll. That's also where you get all the problems, the NIMBY problems, of we don't want the whole of our green and pleasant land to be covered in photovoltaic cells. So that's another problem that has to be dealt with when we think about how we're going to implement um, a, a, a decent future. So just to recap, the capitalist economic system produced a continuous technological revolution based on creative destruction. The industrial revolution depended on carbon and on colonies for cotton, cal calories and markets. And a livable planet in 2100 without global poverty 
depends on innovation and on decoupling growth from carbon emissions. So I told you at the beginning, hockey sticks, skyscrapers, pliers, and those eight Cs. I think there are reasons for hope. So you were 50-50. I could poll you again, but um, you were 50-50 at the beginning. Maybe I've shifted a few of you into the we're not doomed category. Uh, I think that economics can be put to use as a powerful lens for understanding the world and making it work better. There are plenty of problems for you to work on as economists and as, as well as in your role in civil society. And I would strongly urge you uh, to do that. There are a lot of resources available uh, and I've listed some of them here and um, they can be uh, made more widely available to you. Thank you for your patience. So, oh, do we have any questions for the questions and answers? Anything from the floor that you'd like to comment on or reflect on? Anyone bold enough? So let's see, has anyone changed their mind? Would, would anyone change their vote in the Are We Doomed? So stick your hand up if you would, change your, if you, if you would now change your mind. A few. It's a tough crowd. A few. Yeah, no, no, there are a few. Okay, very good. I'm not going to ask you to explain it, so you can be bold and stick your hand up. There's one hand there, so yeah. we'll take that hand while we can. Yeah. No, no, I don't think. You see, you didn't have be, a question. Oh. I was just getting a, 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 a poll. poll. Right. Oh. But if you'd yeah, like to ask a question, do do go ahead. Oh. Enthusiasm, <clears> my end. I apologise. Wendy, I'd like to ask one question just to get us going. Sort of. Um, I'll, Africa's surprisingly or unsurprisingly missing from a lot of the data. Does that affect, if we really think about a sort of an African push next, does that really affect the models? Okay, so first question is, what's this a photo of? Does anyone recognise it? Where this is? Yes, Table Mountain, yes. Okay, so that's the fires. Uh, so this is Africa. Africa has made an appearance. Um, yes, so the, uh, the Africa is the young continent. Uh, it's, it's where population growth is going to be concentrated over the, the next decades. Africa is absolutely not the source of the climate crisis. And the kind of trajectories in these scenarios are ones that enable uh, the population uh, and the growing population of Africa to move up in terms of higher levels of GDP, so out of extreme poverty. And in that, uh, the, the, the scenario number five, the green one, the five times as large, that has Africa um, pulling up to levels of uh, average income that we would not be surprised at. Thank you. Okay, so that's not going to happen automatically, and that's really what, uh, what, what one of the challenges. If you get, if you go in and read the, uh, read read about these scenarios, I've only presented you with the two more or less benign ones. There, there are there are very depressing ones in between that are all about international conflict, and uh, so doing nothing about inequality, large uh, migration movements, and so on. So. You may think that the path we're on at the moment is not captured by either of these um, the, the scenarios that, that, I, that I pointed out. Anyone else? I'll bring you the mic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as Africa keeps growing really rapidly over like, the next century, uh, what effect do you think that will have on international relations? There are reasons to think that success in Africa, so achieving solutions to some of the really serious governance problems in Africa, uh, that that would reduce international tensions and would reduce, for example, pressures for migration. So it seems to be a very high order um, problem, international problem, to, to address uh, those problems 
which are characteristic of many African countries, a very weak governance. Um, and some of the work that economists have done has been able to track uh, those weaknesses to, uh, to slavery. So it turns out that the places, the locations in Africa from which enslaved people were taken, and this is an, an extraordinary kind of amount of uh, historical analysis to show this, are places that are characterised by less trust now and weaker economic development. So the long shadow of, of the colonial period still stretches over Africa and has made solving those problems much more difficult. But I think even understanding them better and understanding their origins um, can play potentially a role in, uh, in addressing them and in recognising the responsibility of, of, the, uh, of the West for the legacy that has produced many of these tensions in, uh, among Africa, you know, civil wars as well as um, tensions between countries. And over here. Sorry, I'm not as fast as I used to be when I was younger, so I do apologise. <laughs> Very interesting. So, so I think uh, maybe perhaps another element that was a little bit missing was uh, trade. Uh, so, what is your take on trade and climate change? Yeah, that's a very that's a very good question. I mean, we've all benefited tremendously from uh, globalization, and part of the the success of specialization, for example, in China in producing PV cells and so on, has was made possible by the entry of China into the World Trade Organization. So globalization has, uh, has both added to the climate problem and uh, is, is, is part of the solution. So I think that, um, so I'm definitely not, I would definitely not argue in terms of closing down borders. I think that uh, there will be a more balanced approach to globalization because uh, the, the, the requirement for resilience has become viewed as being uh, ec economically salient in a way that it wasn't really before and was really brought to the fore, fore by the pandemic. But I think as part of the, um, the, the fragility that's associated with the climate crisis will also underscore the need for resilience. And so there'll be less of, the, of a pressure for open, um, for, for ever more open, uh, um, or, or if you like, volume of, of international trade. But that's not an argument for closing borders. Do you, what, what, what do you think? What, what's your perspective? Uh, well, I, yeah. you go. Uh, I actually even have an even more optimistic view about trade as a way also to, you know, to influence other countries. Uh, you know, climate change is global, but we have little to say, with little say on what other countries are doing. But trade agreements and you know trade relationship can be a way to, you know, not enforce, but you know, encourage good behavior in exchange for, um, you know, for, for trade and, and and growth. So you know, there is also that aspect of you know trade, free trade agreements, as a as a leverage for you know uh, climate change talks and. Yeah, yeah. So in the same way that some other kinds of standards have been raised through coupling um, uh, trade agreements with requirements to meet certain um, uh, benchmarks. Yeah, good. You can pass it back to her. You can ask and hand it back. some parallels between both um, colonies and capitalism. So for example, there are like 14 countries in Africa using the CFA franc, which is a which is a colonial currency. Um, and <coughs> while they're not being like directly they're not still colonized the way they were before, do you think that they're rebranding um, the kind of colonization of Africa in the form of capitalism and trade? So give your example again, I didn't catch it. Um, so 14 countries in Africa, in Western Central Africa, they're using the CFA franc currencies, which are 
a legacy currency from yeah. the yeah yeah yeah. But what's the connection you're trying to draw well, between um, the use of those currencies and and the effects? Um, the poor, they obviously the um, quite like. In, specifically with DFA Frank, the French were just basically taking the resources that were in these countries, but now they're being they're buying them almost like a monopoly, like a monopoly. So what's the, what's the word? Mm -hmm. One buyer. Um, so they're basically the main buyer of the um, of the resources because they get them for the low market rate. So do you think that this new form of this kind of trade? Is still a form of colonization somewhere. Well, yes. The example you've given, it it, it absolutely is. Yeah. yeah. So there's there's no. Um, so I mean, I don't know the case that you're you're referring to, but it's it, it it appears to be the case that the terms on which trade are taking place are being manipulated from from the West. Um, and do you think there is a way that these countries can have can receive more of the benefits of trading their resources than they are now? Yeah, and I think that this is a really tough problem. I think there is some, uh, some contribution that's being made through the international uh, organisations. Uh, and there's a, a lot of this has got to do with raising um, finance and uh, quite a lot of work in the last few years kind of coming out of the IPCC and so on has really focused on... Um, uh, on <coughs> pooling capital to make, to, again, to kind of try and shift the, 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 the power relationship uh, towards those, um, uh, those economies. And just as an example, there are lots of technologies that would be very uh, um, profitable to adopt at, at a 5% interest rate, but not at a 15% interest rate. And those countries may be paying 15%, 20% and more. So it's dealing with some of those financing costs that I think uh, progress is happening um, with coalitions of uh, the international organisations and some large private um, parties. So I'm not entirely pessimistic about that. So I've got one at the front and one here. And I think they'll, yeah. Do you want to go first okay. and we'll come back to you? Ah. So on the, on the graph, you see there's like 10x growth uh, with fossil fuels and like 5x growth with greenhouse, uh, like green road. Um, yeah. So, like, so, so who's got the mic? I can't see. He's there. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, I mean, like, the 5x growth is like quite easy for us to like stomach because we live like, we have quite a great life, like living standard here in our country. But do you think it's fair for us to limit the growth or slow the growth of like people that countries that are trying to develop like nowadays to like reduce the the green of like to reduce the like the effects on pollution that like the West caused back in like the industrial revolution like, we kind of caused it and are they have to like suffer the slower growth to fix what we like caused? Yeah yeah so so I think if you look at the if you look at that scenario the crucial element that I uh, tried to highlight was that uh, global inequality, so inequality among citizens of the world in that in 2100 on that uh, green scenario would be uh, roughly the same as inequality in Denmark. We mainly think of Denmark as being not a very unequal country. So that means that it, it, the great bulk of the five times growth of, of the world is for those, uh, uh, those people in poverty now and with low incomes now. So you're absolutely right that 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 is at the heart of that scenario. And that's one of the reasons, for example, that it's a scenario that doesn't have lots of wars and lots of uh, migration. And uh, so, it's a, so it's a kind of benign scenario. But of course, the question is, how do, we, how do we get to implement it? We have one last one here, unless there's anyone else with a desperate question. Um, yeah, so this is wondering, um, what do you think the responsibilities are for people who are residents of the United Kingdom, for example. So those who have benefited from colon, uh, colonization, benefit fr benefited from capitalism. Well, where do you think our responsibilities rise, um, lie as individuals? Yes, I think our responsibilities lie in, in getting involved, in trying to, uh, uh, just in, as a sort of shorthand way of putting it, um, putting uh, the UK onto the onto its 
is part of that green scenario. So I think we do have we do have a role to play. We have a we have a role as citizens, for example, uh, to uh, to try to influence the policies that are uh, that are being implemented in this country. There's a you know there's a bigger question which you are perhaps um, hinting at, which is the sort of reparations question, and that's that's what's being uh, to some extent discussed within these broader international. Um, agreements and with the big focus on trying to direct finance as a way of providing the uh, the material resources for the for the regions and countries that were affected in the way that you suggest and the way I I suggested when I was talking about Africa and trust. So there is a responsibility on on us. Okay, there is one last question in the front here, and I am going to give him the mic. Is that okay, Wendy? Yeah, of course. Come. As an entrepreneur, like current affairs, you think about the invasion of Ukraine and the increase in inflation and um, like the cost of living crisis, do you think climate change should be a major priority for governments? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it, it's also a question for, for us, right? For us as economists or economists to be. You know, what should we be working on? Should we, we be working on... Uh, the climate crisis or on the, the consequences of the Euro, uh, war in Ukraine should we be thinking about uh, the cost of living crisis. And, you know, we should be doing all of these things. Uh, I mean, my, my own work is kind of scattered around these, uh, some of these different questions. But at the root of it, I think, is trying to develop uh, a coherent understanding of how the economic system works. And then you can kind of choose where you think you're going to make the most difference in intervening. But all the pieces should fit together in a coherent way. And I think that's our, the challenge to us as economists, to provide you with the tools for integrating those questions so that you are then able to articulate exactly as you were saying, uh, how these things are related and how we should if we're kind of talking in, in terms of political platforms, how we should be prioritising. Because we can try to connect some of those dots. I'm mindful of the need to get back to school, but you see, so you will be my last question. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to ask that, um, if you personally believe there might be a need for a change in the economic system from perhaps capitalism to maybe a whole new system, and if so, um, if you believe that should happen, what like active policies would you encourage? Yeah, that's that is a great question. It's a kind of it's it's the big challenge. And I suppose what I was trying to do this afternoon in a sort of fairly small number of minutes is to give you a sense of uh, the bright side of capitalism and what capitalism, as compared with other economic systems, has has provided which is innovation. So if we compare capitalism, for example, with central planning, which is a completely different way of organising the economy, and one that was very weak at uh, producing innovation. So I don't think that, that we can assume there's some other way that will provide us with uh, the kind of solutions that we need to the problems we face. So I think capitalism has... There are good things about it. The... The creative destruction process is, is, uh, is positive in that sense, but we have to make use of the, uh, of the other parts of that triangle to constrain the ill effects of capitalism. And for example, the, if you just go back to Adam Smith, he, he explained how capitalism worked, but he, he was very, very focused on this problem that, that if you have innovated successfully, then you're going to put up put up the barriers. You don't want anyone else coming along and getting your profits. So maintaining competition, uh, stimulating entry is absolutely crucial to get that aspect of capitalism working. And m many of the, of the ill effects of capitalism are because, because of the, the weakness of, uh, of competition. So allowing mergers to occur uh, when they shouldn't, for example, um, uh, just empowering those incumbents. And if 
the incumbents are empowered, then <laughs> capitalism isn't, isn't contributing what it could do. So, so what you say is, is right. I just don't think there's kind of some off-the-shelf alternative that, that, we, that we know about. And the other final point to make is that um, companies from all kinds of capitalist countries compete in markets, but those individual countries differ in many respects. So Denmark is very different from the United States. Canada is very different from the United States. So there are, there's a lot of variety uh, among capitalist countries, and that can also provide some indications of where uh, you may be able to get a better mixture. Um, so the United States is, the, is very effective at innovation, but terrible at sharing the prosperity among, among its citizens. Thank you. Can we thank Wendy for her first?